and we should be live. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another session with Dental Shadowers. Today, we have an exciting session with Dr. Casado. Dr. Casado, thank you so much for joining. And uh, on that note, the floor is yours to take away. No, no, thank you guys for, first of all, planning such a great idea and putting, you know, a lot of doctors together. And this is, you know, as soon as I, I got the email, I was all in and congratulate you guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, so should I start? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. All right, everyone. So my journey to become a dentist, um, I actually kind of wanted to start my with my uh, origin. I was actually born in Quito, Ecuador, South America, one of the best places in South America that you can visit. Um, and I want to share this because I was actually influenced by my grandfather, who is an ENT, and I was influenced in healthcare by him because he did a lot of community service, lots of help for people. So that's how my, my journey began. Um, later on, my family moved to the United States and we came to Chicago and I was raised in the Northwest side of Chicago. Um, from there, I went to UIC, uh, University of Illinois in Chicago. I was a bio, biochem major, biology minor. Um, later, I actually lived in Miami um, for a year and a half and I did a master's in biomedical sciences. And I'll, I'll explain a little more about that and please feel free to ask any questions for anyone who's thinking about applying to master's program before going into dental school. I can give you lots of lots of feedback on that and I'll, I'll go over it as well. Um, after my master's, I went to UIC College of Dentistry while in dental school. Um, I always try to stay involved uh, with the student body. And that's another thing that I will highly, highly recommend you guys to do uh, once you get into dental school. Stay active. Uh, you get to meet a lot of people in dental school. Uh, you get to interact with a lot of faculty. Um, it was great. Um, in my second year, I was actually the pre dental chair. That's, um, I hosted a bunch of pre dental nights at UIC, and I talked to a bunch of uh, high schoolers, um, college students. So I feel pretty, pretty happy that I'm able to continue with something like this tonight. Um, I was also the uh, president of the Hispanic Dental Association. And in my last year, I was uh, the student council president. And at the end, I graduated 2019, not too long ago. So still a pretty, pretty uh, recent grad, new dentist, um, but no complaints. It's an amazing journey. Um, that was my D1 year. Um, and that was at the end. And, you know, I cannot wait until all of you guys can go through the same things that I went through because dental school was definitely the best time of my life, more than uh, college. Um, and just a little recap of my journey to become a dentist. Um, like I said, uh, I'm an unconventional applicant. I was an unconventional applicant because I did my master's prior to dental school um, and like I said for anyone who wants to do that route um, it's not a bad option um, but if you want to apply to down school right after college also it's a you know most students do that as well okay um, and here are my my biggest biggest tips for the DAT this is what I did and this is what it worked for me um, I was a big big fan of the DAT boot camp great practice questions really similar to the actual test. Um, and they have a lot, I know it's a little a little expensive. Uh, a couple of pre-dental students, they tell me, they're like, oh yeah, it's a, it's a little it's a little too much, but trust me, it's really, really worth it, especially for the uh, practice test that um, they have. Destroyer, Kaplan textbook, pretty straightforward, pretty standard. But something that I started doing when I was studying for the DAT and that I still did for my boards and for some of the tests in dental school, I always try to mimic uh, an exam day with practice tests. So this is something that you definitely wanna do. Timing is important. You wanna time yourself. Once, you, once you've once you gone over all the, all the material, all, you know, all the sciences, all the PATs and, and everything, you definitely wanna time yourself. You wanna to go to the library or you wanna go somewhere where you're not gonna be bothered and you wanna like mimic the, an exam day. And then that's, that's how you're gonna see. You, that, um, you might wanna take more time and review a little more 
uh, biology or math or the PAT. And then that's how you're gonna know. And trust me, you will use that for your boards as well. So this is a, such a nice habit you have, especially early for the DAT and it works. Um, personal statement, huge, huge, huge part of your application process. Um, a lot of people I remember when I was applying, they had a review uh, by the professor, their cousin, their friend. My advice would be to only have a review by only two or three people. You don't want too many changes, too many, you know, everyone has a, a different opinion. Um, and if you, if you guys can definitely find someone who's in healthcare, that would be the best option. But, you know, max three, but if you keep that number to maybe one or two, that's the best option. You don't want to make too many changes, too many switches. It gets too complicated. So personal statement is very important. You know, honesty is key. Keep it real, keep it simple. And that's how they want to know you. They want to read it and they want to see it. It's like, oh, okay, this person is actually, you know, they're not just saying the same two lines, you know, um, I want to become a dentist because blah, blah, blah. You know, just keep it simple, keep it real. Um, interview, go over your interview, uh, your personal statement. They're going to read it. They're going to have it in front of them. Um, like I said, keep it real. That is your, the biggest selling point. Aside from grades, they definitely want to get to know you. Um, make sure you review your application. Mock interviews, this is also very important. Um, in my school, UAC actually did a really, really nice program where they hosted mock interviews. So they really mimic the whole interview process. They, uh, they made us dressed up and everything. So if you guys can do, hopefully your schools or the pre-dental club can organize mock interviews, that'll be amazing. Or just have one of your friends or, you know, if, someone who's a little a little more involved in you know application process or you know someone who's a little more professional that'll be also really really good uh, good idea the student doctor network um that was another thing that i really like going into those forums you get lots of reviews of you know so sometimes you'll get questions that people people had um and you know it's kind of helpful it's kind of fun to see what everyone's going through and you know, you kind of help each other. Um, like I said, like I mentioned, I was an probation applicant. I decided to do my master's in biomedical sciences from Bayer University in Miami, just to make my application stronger. Um, I thought my, my GPS was good, but I didn't feel that it was like super, super strong. So I did this master's program. And like I said, it was a good option for me. It worked for me. My science GPA went skyrocket. And I was able to feel really prepared for dental school. Not everyone's gonna do that, but you know, I, I, I definitely had at least five classmates who did you know, multiple different uh, programs before dental school. So, um, and feel free to ask me more about that. Um, and here's another, another big, big tip. Um, make sure you have your personal statement, all the information prepared ahead, because you definitely wanna submit the application the day off. You want to submit it right away, um, even even if you haven't taken the DAT. But you definitely want to have the personal statement filled in. Everything I remember, I submitted my application the same day. I still haven't taken my DAT, and that can be um, updated, uploaded later. But you definitely want to save the spot in line because once you save the spot in line, you can keep updating your 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 file, um, letters of recommendation, DAT. It doesn't have everything. Doesn't have to be upload it for you to sub submit it. And people get it so confused or they get so worried. I was like, oh, you know, I haven't taken my DAT. No, just submit it and then it will get uploaded and, and you'll save the spot in line. Um, like I said, keep submitting uh, required documents and just wait for the, uh, the interview. That's another exciting part. Um, what is dentistry? Uh, this is actually my, my philosophy with dentistry. Dentistry is a profession that allows me to combine my passion for art and science while meeting a wide variety of people. Um, I love, that's, that's one of my favorite things about the industry. I love meeting all kinds of people, different backgrounds, different ra uh, race, different age. Um, di you know, I, it's just so engaging to just learn from each other, learn from, from a lawyer, learn from, uh, at the other day I actually did a root canal on a uh, high school, uh, uh, Counselor, so it was like you know, it, it gets it gets more exciting as you go on. 
Um, a typical day as, as a general dentist, um, I just kind of wanted to give you a little, little start on the two different offices where I work. Um, Lake Dental Care is in the heart of downtown Chicago. Um, we do a lot of uh, cosmetic dentistry. Uh, we do same day crowns, very high end dentistry. Um, definitely uh, one of my favorite uh, dental offices that I worked um, in Joyful Dental Care. It's a different style, still beautiful office in, um, in the suburban area of Chicago. And this is, this is what I told you guys that being a, uh, a journal dentist is awesome because you, you get to choose the two different styles of, of practicing, practicing dentistry. Still a general dentist, but on job for dental care, I get to see more families, more little kids sometimes, or like more seniors that sometimes I'm not get to see in uh, at like dental care. Um, so yeah, uh, a typical day, depending on my schedule, sometimes I'll go to uh, dental care, job for dental care, and they'll have my schedule ready. Um, and always, always do a morning huddle. It's so helpful to just um, get updated with, if it's a, a patient of my boss who's uh, getting a root canal with me, and then sometimes she or he might have a specific dental phobia or dental need that we need to go over that. Sometimes we just go over uh, medical history, but it's, it's just a nice way to get to know the patient before we even get to see the patient. And then, you know, just a typical, you know, uh, someone needs to get their medical history updated and so on and so on. But, you know, having a morning puddle is super nice in my opinion. Um, and like I said, as a general dentist, we, we get to do and see a lot of different kinds of things. Um, uh, comprehensive dental examinations, um, hygiene checks or recall examinations, emergencies. Those are uh, my favorite ones as well because you never know what you're gonna get. It can, it can be an extraction, it could be a root canal, or it can just be something a little, a little more simple that the patient is kind of freaking out. Um, and it could be just a, a simple composite filling. And I'll, I'll extend a little more on that as well. And these are just my, my bread and butter, you know, day-to-day -day, um, procedures, a composite filling, very straightforward, uh, small, small cavity here. As you can see, this is the filling. Uh, we have a rubber dam, a, a dental clamp that is isolating the teeth from saliva and bacteria. Um, and that will increase the uh, longevity of the dental filling on that tooth. Um, and then I get to do some cosmetic dentistry as well, like doing those before and after, um, improving the patient's overall health, removing decay and making the patient feel more comfortable with their smile. Um, uh, this takes, you know, some skill, some some eye in terms of um, shape matching, and I'll, I'll I'll show you guys some tips as well later on. Um, this is what I tend to do in, on my everyday. And like I said, um, emergencies, emergencies are my um, my favorite things as well. It can either be a root canal or it could be an extraction. Um, like in this case, I'm, and I'm sure I'm not gonna go in like the little boring details of like this is an animal, this is dented, but as you can see on this tooth right here, the patient presented with throbbing, dull, achy pain, sensitive, sensitive to hot and cold. And you, know, you can see the, the dark shadow here, very, very close to the nerve and run some tests, some eyes, ice test um, and just to verify that that tooth is the one causing the patient pain. And this is just a sequence of doing a root canal, getting my, my working length, verifying that I'm getting all the way to the uh, apex of the tooth, um, making sure that my, my gutta percha cone, gutta percha is the final filling that goes into the canal, just to make sure everything is where I need it to be, all the way at the apex, nice and straight, nothing's going off. Um, of center, and then this is my final fill with a build of material. And then these two, there's gonna need a root canal. Uh, I'm sorry, a crown, because after we complete a root canal, teeth become a little uh, brittle. And I always tell my patients, um, imagine, it, because patients always ask me, why do I need a, a, a crown now? Well, imagine if you remove all the blood supply, all the nerve from that tooth, the tooth is gonna get dried out. Um, and from those biting forces, when patients are eating and, and biting, the tooth can fracture without a crown. So that's my explanation for my patients. I always try to make it simple because, um, you know, as a dental professional, we know 
all these scientific words and everything, but our patients are not really related with all these dental terminology, but you guys will, will definitely learn everything, but always, it's always nice to keep it simple for the patients and for pre-dental students as well. I have um, one question, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, please, no, please stop me at any time. Thank you. Um, so what is the one thing that you look for, like in the x-ray on the left, to see that that patient needs a root canal or like right. he has pain? Yes, yeah, so um, x-ray is a must for any any emergency. So we always take a, uh, an x-ray just to see, what, you know, because sometimes it can be just food getting, getting stuck in between the teeth. But in this case, as you can see, this dark shadow here right. on the tooth, very, very close to the nerve. Um, and you can see this is the outer layer of the tooth that does enamel and the inner layer of the tooth does dentin. Um, unfortunately, this patient has not been to the dentist for, for quite a long time. This is how you get these big, big cavities right here that is very close to the nerve. Also, oh, the dark shadow is the cavity. That is the cavity. That is decay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and this is what, you know, the dark shadow, this is what we look for whenever we have to do uh, fillings. As you can see on, on the lower right, uh, the big molar, this tooth right here, that's another small cavity that hasn't gone all the way to the nerve, but it's a small shadow here, um, a small cavity that this mm. patient uh, needs to get done. And this is the early stage of a cavity, and right here is the uh, later stage. Unfortunately, the, it's too late now because he's in, He's in pain. He's symptomatic, and um, and in need of what we can know. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Yeah, no, no. Please feel free to um, uh, to ask questions. I yeah. appreciate it. Um, extractions. Unfortunately, in this case, this patient presented with a root canal, with an existing root canal here, and at the root level, at the, at the tip of the root, as you can see, this dark shadow as well. That's an infection of the tooth, um, infection assists a dental, dental infection can, um, can look like this. And as you can see, this tooth has also fracture um, halfway through the tooth. Uh, this is a horizontal fracture. And like I said, unfortunately, this, this patient did not get a crown. Uh, this patient did not get a post. Uh, to hold the tooth in place after the root canal. And this is what it can happen. If patients don't follow uh, our protocols and most likely this patient was a, either a clencher, clenching and grinding his teeth um, a lot. And this is a front tooth that you, front teeth don't really hold a lot of occlusal forces, but you know, we, we're still shredding and we're still biting. Um, unfortunately, this patient had to lose this tooth. And what we had to do is um, extract um, the root canal treated tooth, remove the infection. And in this case, um, because of his finances, we couldn't do an immediate implant, but he definitely wanted to get, an, he definitely wanted to get an implant in the future. So what we did it was a bone graft. We filled the space of this tooth with um, cadaver bone and placed it in there and for him because he was a young patient actually. He, I think he was like, he was like around my age and and you know, losing the front tooth, um, high smile and everything. So I tried to make it work. And I, as you can tell, I sectioned the tooth after the extraction and I bonded it with some um, a metal uh, ortho wire. Um, so he can have his own tooth while he's healing from the extraction and while he's healing for the uh, bone graft. Um, and then he came back a month later, uh, we gave him a more definitive, um, uh, uh, tooth that it was a, a flipper because he said, Doc, I'm not going to get this implant for at least uh, a year or two, but I'm going to need something because I know, because I told him, we did this temporary the day off, right after the extraction. We bonded it in and, you know, no, no, uh, uh, with really high chances of like losing that tiny little little tube with these bonded wires. So we give him a little flipper, a little removable uh, denture in the meantime until he's financially ready to get an implant. Any questions on this one? No, that was perfect, thank you. Awesome, perfect. Um, and then, um, like I said, after getting a root canal, this student needed a, um, a crown. Um, sorry for the, um, 
blurry picture, um, just a straightforward uh, crown preparation. Um, the blue, the blue filling, and that, that is the building material that we use to reshape after we remove the decay and, and doing um, uh, a root canal. After that, this patient uh, gained a nice, a nice Emax crown, and it looked, hopefully, it looked like nothing, nothing happened there. Um, like I said, shade matching is key. You definitely want to practice your eyes, um, looking at different shades of, of uh, reds and whites and, and yellows, mostly yellows, because a, a lot, a lot of patients have like tend to have like more of the uh, uh, darker yellow teeth as well. And I'll give you some tips on how to get, how to train your eye and, and how to uh, get uh, an accurate uh, shade matching as well. Um, pretty, this is my day-to-day, -day, pretty simple, pretty fun as well. Um, being able to help this patient gain a, um, a need to basically uh, with a crown. Uh, shade matching. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Vita's shade guide. This is the must in every uh, in every office for a general dentist. We're constantly doing front front teeth or crown preparations in front teeth, and we have this is a good way to communicate with the lab. Um, like I said, you want to train your eye to pick the right shade of uh, of a crown of a filling because it is the worst time when the patient when you do a really nice. Uh, bonded filling on the front tooth and the patient is like, oh, you know, it, it doesn't really look like my adjacent tooth. That's definitely something that you don't want to hear. Um, and, you know, I definitely take my time picking the right shade. Um, and, you know, you always want to use natural date light. That's the best option. Uh, but I know that is, that might not be the best, uh, the best for a lot of offices that don't have like natural lighting and you're, you're not going to bring the patient out and pick you know the shade outside of the uh outside of the room but you know something to keep in mind for female patients they definitely have to remove their lipstick uh that will trick your eye to picking something that, that is a little too bright as well um you definitely want to hold the shade guy away from your away from your uh sight and that's usually like an arm leg as well. And don't don't take it, don't look at it for too long. Your eyes get tired. Um, all the shades sometimes tend to get mixed up at once if you've been looking at something for too long. And you know, I always ask my assistants, hey, do you agree with this? And sometimes they haven't been looking at the teeth for, for so long, like I have, and they're like, actually, maybe we can do a shade, uh, shade lighter. And then, you know, I was like, all right, well, you know, let, let, let's do that. And then I, you know, verified and, and I was double check with the patient, as you can see in this lower, this lower picture. This is the picture that I'm sending to my, my lab technician. This is her current shade. Uh, she wants to do a shade lighter. This is what I believe she has. Um, do you agree with me? And sometimes they will, they'll tell me right away, they'll, they'll, they'll be like, hey doc, that photo was a little too bright. Would you mind taking another one or so on? And you know, and that's a, that's an, that's another way to have great results, having a great communication with your lab technician and have your favorite lab technician as well. Um, new technology in dentistry. Um, my favorite thing about uh, dentistry nowadays is uh, digital scan. Um, Trio, Ceric, they're awesome. Um, much much comfortable for the patient. Super fun for the clinician. I, I love, as you can see, I'm using this photo again. I love using this uh, digital scanner. Um, I believe this is going to be a gold standard in the future. I, I think every general dentist is going to end up getting this scan. Um, and hopefully, um, dental school, well, my dental school was getting up to speed with, uh, with the digital scans. And hopefully, by the time you guys get, get into dental school, you guys will get a, a lot of uh, training with uh, scanning. Um, this is just um, a lab script for, for, for a patient of mine that we're going to do a crown. This is what uh, my assistants always, you know, fill it up um, and the lab is going to get it the day off, like on the spot. Um, let me see if I can give you guys, and this is another feature of the digital scan. This patient needed a full crown after a full crown. No! 
Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. There you go. Um, and this is another thing that I'd like to do. Um, you can always check, move, rotate, uh, verify different angles. You can do this intraorally looking at the patient, but it's always much nicer to take a nice scan, uh, verify if all the angles are, are good. And if something's a little off, you can go back to the patient and you know prep the tooth a little more. If there's something that you didn't like, you know, if there's something that the margin is a little too tall, too too away from from the uh, from the gum level, you can go back and, and adjust it. And you're you're always checking. And I, I I find these two aside from just taking a digital digital scan is also kind of helping me check my own work, making sure that those walls are not and are, there's no undercuts, that everything is parallel that everything is nice and smooth. And if there's something that I need to fix, I'll go and fix it after seeing it in the scan. Um, so yeah, hopefully you guys get to uh, play with these fancy toys. And I'm pretty glad that um, both of the offices where I work, they, they're pretty up to date with digital scanning. Um, uh, and finally, the case, my big case, um, I like to do conservative dentistry. In my philosophy, not every tooth needs a crown. Um, not every tooth um, needs a big, big filling. Uh, with conservative dentistry, um, we can do inlays, onlays, uh, which are partial crowns that are going to be more conservative for the tooth. So we don't have to prep the whole tooth and we can do just a partial crown. And in this case, uh, minimally invasive veneer preparation is, uh, is something that is getting more and more common nowadays. I think a, a lot of the doctors that I follow on Instagram, they're doing uh, minimal, minimally invasive veneer preparation and I'll explain what it is. Um, but before we get into the uh, fancy stuff and the fun stuff, um, something that is also very important um, is getting to know your patient. Uh, obtaining well-documented information about your patient, social history, medical history, dental history, it's crucial in order to have a, a, a good outcome, um, either an aesthetic outcome or a surgical outcome. A very, very important for, in, in this case, it was a 56-year-old uh, Caucasian female. She didn't like the uh, spaces in, her, in between her teeth, the shape, the color, Unfortunately, she did say that she was a smoke. Oh, wait, patient is a smoker. Yeah, she, she, she was a smoker as I, as I remember. Um, high sugar intake, coffee, and as a dental professional, th this is where it comes very cru crucial because we have to um, educate the patient to lower sugar intake, to lower uh, smoking. Uh, we can also help them with the smoking sens sensation and everything. Um, also another great, great uh, fun part about my job that I get to, you know, just educate the patient about diet, you know, educate the, the patient about, um, you know, coffee. If, you know, I love coffee myself, but I always tell my patient if you can just drink coffee through a straw, it's much, much better uh, in, in terms of like keeping your, your teeth nice and uh, stain free and white and everything. All right, um, radiograph, like I said, big, big, important, uh, big key. Uh, you cannot do anything, anything in dentistry without having a good uh, radiograph. Um, you check uh, any, any infection, any pathologies before doing a, an aesthetic procedure. You check um, uh, all fillings, you check for new cavities. If, you know, the patient has to be completely um, cavity free, infection free, before you do any cosmetic procedure. Everything has to be completely healthy. Um, it might not look nice before we do the cosmetic uh, dentistry, but it has to be in a healthy state. Uh, probing depths. Probing depths are, um, that's when we measure the depth in between the gum and the, um, and the tooth. Um, also very important, um, gum disease. We cannot do any cosmetic procedure when patients have gum disease. Like I said, everything has to be well documented. Have to double check, triple check, because you definitely don't want to do veneers or cosmetic bonding on puffy, puffy inflamed gum gum tissue that the patient is is going to be really upset uh, very uh, later on once you know her, her or his uh, dental uh, cosmetic procedure is failing. 
um, very important. So I have quickly. one question. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. Um, for the probing, when I was shadowing some doctors, I saw them put like uh, different numbers, like one, two, five. And what what do exactly those do those numbers mean for um, like gum levels? Yeah, so I'll, I'll explain that. So basically, if we think about your tooth right here and your gum level here, um, when when dentists may, uh, measure the uh, probing depth, they're measuring how how much in depth they can probe into uh, the soft tissue in, in, into the gum. If, if the gums are inflamed, the problems are gonna be really big because uh, soft tissue, inflamed tissue, it's gonna be, it's gonna be puffy, bigger. Um, mm -hmm. okay. And for health, ones and threes and twos are good, are good numbers. Anything above a three is it's a inflamed. Sign, is inflamed or bone loss as well. Okay, I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, good questions. And for posterior teeth, we'll also check the uh, forcation involvement. If um, sometimes when there's a lot of bone loss uh, that the that the gum and the bone the bone has received, uh, the molar molar teeth uh, in the middle of the tooth, they might you know you might show a little bit of that uh, forcation involvement as well. So yeah, good question. Um, so this is how the patient presented, as I mentioned before, um, um, spaces in, be in between her teeth, uh, misshaped, uh, staining, and uh, you can see some crazy lines. Some um, I, pretty sure she was a she was a grinder clencher, um, and also unfortunately she did not have um, many of her posterior teeth. So that was another issue that she needed to. Um, either get implants, but she was a little, she was getting married and she was, she was kind of like, doc, I need to get veneers before, before my wedding. And I told her, get those, but you know, and down the road, you definitely get to get uh, those uh, posterior implants. So your body is more balanced, but you know, definitely it was nice to help her out before her uh, big day. Um, but that's how she, she presented to us. Uh, treatment plan, um, after, uh, analyzing her x-rays and checking up all her old feelings. She had like some, some crowns here, some other feelings in her posterior teeth. As you can see, more cat, more feelings here. Uh, she needed to get more uh, feeling, uh, veneers here. So the, her treatment plan was just a combination of, this is the initial treatment plan, a combination of uh, porcelain veneers uh, uh, with a crown and, and two um, partial crowns as well. And then at the end, I always like to recommend uh, NICAR after any cosmetic procedure, especially with like veneers, you definitely want to protect them um, so they don't fall, they don't break, they don't, um, they don't especially if the, the patient is a clencher, like I mentioned, she was definitely a grinder clencher. So we definitely wanted to protect those, those nice teeth. Um, once again, that's how she presented. Um, so you, for a cosmetic, procedure, you always want to take diagnostic imp uh, impressions and alginate impression. So you can have uh, study models and analyze her bite, analyze how everything is uh, it's aligned and then do a wax up. This is, I actually did the wax up myself, but lab technicians can do a much, much nicer uh, wax ups and much, much easier because that's what they're doing on a daily basis. Um, but I don't, I don't mind doing, doing wax ups. As you can see on, on the lower, on, on the right um, picture, um, we were able to put everything aligned um, in the arch form. And then on the other one, everything looked pretty symmetrical. This is, it's kind of like, we can use it as a test drive as well, just to present uh, the patient how we want things to look like before she commits to something that is gonna you know, look completely different to her smile. Um, and this is what we thought that it, it would look nice on her. And, and then we did a mock-up. We took an impression of this wax up uh, with a special product, a potty product that it will, it will mimic that, uh, that wax up. And then we can put it intraorally on her, on, her, on her own teeth and see if she likes the design, if she likes everything that we're we're trying to accomplish. And this is a good, good time for the patient to let us know, actually, I don't like my teeth to look, um, you know, too, 
too long or too pointy or or you know the, the angles are too sharp or or you know and this is a good time for 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 you as a dentist to make changes to adjust your your wax so adjust uh the complaints that the patient is having before you even you know prep the teeth and do the uh and do the uh, the delivery day because you know once once you prep the teeth and you you already um, requested veneers that the patient was not aware that they were gonna look like that. That's you know that's too late. Um, but you know I always like to do a wax up, mock up, and do a test drive and see if the patient agrees with the design that we're trying to accomplish for her or for him. And this is how. The, uh, behind this, uh, her own teeth, but this is the uh, the test drive, the mock-up that we presented to her, and we told her this is something that we can accomplish with veneers and the new crowns. Do you like them? And she goes, Yeah, I, you know, we improved the uh, misshape, the length, because before they looked too short. Um, I believe she she definitely didn't like a little bit of the. Uh, uh, these line angles here of the laterals. So we told her, you know, that's something very, very easy to, to fix, but she liked everything else. And, you know, I adjusted my wax up because uh, that wax up, I sent it back to the uh, lab technician so they can see exactly what I'm, you know, I presented to my patient as well. And usually, like I said, um, usually I'll, I'll send that to the lab and the lab will have, you know, they'll take impression of the wax up and do, do everything, but, you know, Nothing, nothing wrong with doing your own wax ups as well. Um, and like I said, minimally invasive uh, technique is because one, once we presented that to the patient, we can prepare the teeth, prep the teeth through the mock-up in order to reduce very, very small amount of, of tissue structure. Um, you prep through the, uh, the mock-up material and then uh, you only need 0.3 millimeters in order to have proper adhesive um, uh, adhesive structure with the tooth and the adhesive uh, product that we use. Um, so it's very, very, very conservative. But unfortunately, like, like I mentioned before, she had some old fillings on these lateral teeth um, and her teeth ended up being um, crowned instead of just partial crowns, veneers, as you can see right here. We, we initially treatment plan the, the that's another thing as a dentist, you have to be ready to think outside the box and prepare to adapt and change. Uh, we initially told her that we could we could potentially do uh, two veneers here as well. Unfortunately, she had some big fillings that, that were too big. So we told her that on the spot, I'm, I'm sorry, we cannot do veneers of those two teeth. You were gonna need crowns and she, she was fine with it. So we did two crowns here two veneers here, more veneers here, and she already had a crown there and veneers in the back as well. So this is how everything looked, a little scary. Uh, I was trying not to show my patients, um, you know, how you know how the, the teeth look um, prepared, but this is how a proper uh, veneer and crown preparation looks like. And this is when we take a final impression and send it to the lab, and then we temporize it. And delivery day, that's my favorite day. Once everything has gone through um, um, as planned, um, we have the, the nice looking, brighter uh, brighter and nicer looking veneers. Uh, we use um, uh, test drive material. It's called uh, Relix test uh, cementing bonding. So as you can see, this is not the definitive uh, cement here. This is just to see if she was okay with everything. And then we show her to her and she okay everything. And then we use the uh, definitive uh, cement as well. And she was pretty ecstatic. And that's when everything was bonded with the final cement right here. And as I said, we improved the shade, the shape. Um, she was pretty happy with everything. A quick before and after um, right here. And right, right between her two front teeth and right here, a little bit of her um, gum receded from the uh, temporary material that we had. But uh, luckily those uh, 
that pupilla will fill in because the, uh, the contact point right here will allow for, for soft tissue. This was just like right after we cemented them, um, but nothing to worry about. Uh, that was an issue that it was, it was, it was fixed um, after a couple of weeks, but yeah, we improve um, uh, shade, shape, and even her lip support. I'm, I'm not sure if you guys can realize how before when she was smiling, her lip was also very, very low. And now that maybe she was just smiling, she was like looking even happier, but even a little bit more of a lip support because we added material and stuff like, like really reducing, you know, tooth structure because we add a little more to the front because they were like pretty, pretty flat, pretty small teeth for a, you know, for a nice lady. And an advice for you guys, um, Charles Darwin is one of my favorite scientists. Um, and I decided to get this quote because it just, it goes so well for, for you guys. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the, the most intelligent that survives. It is the, the one that is most adaptable to change. Um, you know, applying to dental school, it's time for the DAT and looking at all those big goals, big, big accomplishments. Um, you know, sometimes it can look a little scary, but, you know, just keep, keep working hard, stay motivated, help each other out, um, you know, be part of, of a pre-dental club and, you know, brainstorm together, help each other because that's how you're going to succeed just by being committed and, you know, not giving up. And that's how, um, you know, it got me where I am now. And you know, more than more than happy to answer more questions. And thank you guys for having me here. Thank you so much, Doctor Casado. Uh, no. We're gonna go. We're gonna go ahead and um, read out some questions, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Awesome. So our first question is: Can you speak more about your experience at UIC Dentistry? What did you like, and what did you not like? Oh yeah. Um, um, I love the fact that um, it was. It's here in, in, in downtown Chicago, lots of patients, tons of patients, tons of patients, so I love that. It was also a very small class. Uh, it was only 50 of us in, in my class. So it was, it, it really felt like a family. It was a very, um, like a very family oriented uh, vibe. Um, it, 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 um, what else? Tons of patients. I, I was able, I was very, very lucky to, to do a, tons of work. As you can see, um, I feel pretty confident doing surgical procedures, root canals, um, um, and I was lucky enough to do them because UIC was able to provide me with those patients. UIC is in the heart of Chicago, um, very close to you know, a very dense population. And you know, all, me and a lot of my, my classmates, we, you know, we, we had exposure to do a lot of cases. So I'm gonna say that was one of my favorite things about UIC. Uh, the clinic also science, super strong with science. Uh, UIC is um, very, very prideful about, you know, having 100% passing rate and everything like that. Cause the one year was pretty tough. They really, really uh, trained us really well because they really wanted us to like succeed and you know to keep that, keep that. But aside from that, aside from the uh, studies, I think the patient pool was it was my favorite thing. I love being in clinic and you know if if you're really committed, you can definitely um, you know get a great exposure. Sounds like a good school. Yeah. Could you give a brief explanation about what is the Hispanic Dental Association? Yeah, so um, I actually had no idea that, you know, something like that existed in, you know, in, 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 in dental schools. Um, but going in, and that's another, another thing about UIC that it was, it was my favorite thing that is very diverse, uh, very welcoming for um, the Hispanic community, the um, Middle Eastern community, the Asian community. Um, so actually, they all, everyone had um, the Asian community, uh, the Asian student body had their own club. Um, and me as being Hispanic, um, uh, the Hispanic the Dental Association always tried to do uh, community service um, 
we always try to do uh, fundraising to to uh, do uh, uh, health fairs and volunteer in um, in low income schools and churches in, in the south side of Chicago. So we did a lot of um, you know fundraising events, uh, community service, um, some social events as well. It's Hispanics we like to dance. We did a lot of like dancing uh, events as well. Uh, but it was just mostly you know just getting all the all the all the Hispanics in in you know. In one big group, and also, you know, um, we started getting a lot of new members that were not Hispanic, because you know you don't have to be Hispanic to be part. You know, so many, so many other students who were just interested in like learning about the Hispanic community, they will join our our uh, student body, and they, you know, they'll they'll be part of it, and they still were, you know, volunteering. And they will still going to, uh, you know, like the social events, or they were still going to. Uh, um, we actually had this one um, community community based uh, demo opportunity where we were able to as second years we were able to do fillings at this dental clinic in Chicago that it was only hosted by the uh, Hispanic um, dental association so that was another big big selling point for us too and you know educate everyone a little more about uh, food and, and things like that and being Hispanic. That's nice. Yeah. What would you say is the hardest part of your job? Um, I would say, well, it depends. Um, it, it would be, you know, love my patients, but sometimes, um, you know, you, uh, you can deal with, with a patient that, you know, he might have a, you know, a dental phobia. Um, and he really, you know, and sometimes they just might need, um, you know, a simple composite filling. And, you know, and, you know, it takes, it takes a lot more, more power to, you know, deal with a patient that, um, you know, has a dental phobia, has anxiety, has, you know, things like that, that, you know, you know, in the back of your head is like, oh, it's just a filling, but, you know, for that patient, having that, you know, uh, the phobia, it, it, it's a lot for them. So I would say just kind of like being able to help them ease that anxiety, help them, you know, being able to just do the work. I would say that's kind of like a tough, a tough portion of my job sometimes, because I want to help them. <laughs> right, right. Um, I'm wondering what made you choose general dentistry versus specializing? Uh, yeah, great question. So I, I actually, um, I never went into dental school thinking, oh, I want to be an old surgeon or oh, I want to be an antidontist. I, that's another tip that I would say, um, going to dental school, super open-minded. Um, I just went in and, and see what, you know, what what drove my attention to a specific field. Um, and to be honest, I, I like doing a little bit of everything. Um, you know, I, I kept like learning because you learn feelings and then, you, you know, you learn oral surgery and then you learn root canals. And I was like, wow, this is kind of exciting. Like I found everything like a little, a little, a little challenging, a little exciting, but I think I just couldn't decide while I was in Dallas, but I couldn't really decide uh, if there was only one thing that I wanted to do. Um, like I said, I had really good exposure uh, with my patients. A lot of my patients needed, needed like wisdom tear extraction, like simple, simple. Um, and some of them needed like root canals. And, you know, I had my, my faculty help me there and I asked for help and, you know, guidance and everything. And, you know, and I kept having more patients like that. And like, you know, this, you know, I, I, I like that, um, that change. Having, you know, doing a nice scrum prep and then doing a, a root canal and then doing a, you know, a, an extraction. And I, I think that that was for me. I was like, I kind of like a little bit of everything. I don't think I can pick. Oh, okay. That's nice. Um, is who makes the, who produces the crowns and the implants? Is that the general dentist or like a lab technician? Uh, so at one of my offices, the one in downtown, um, we make we make the um, we print them in office, so we we're 
then it's a slash lab text, but it takes it takes like half an hour to to get a, a crown ready from the uh, 3D printer. Uh, but at the other office, we still take the scans and do everything, and then we send it to the lab. Um, but for for bigger cases, for uh, aesthetic cosmetic veneer case, we'll send them to a service, someone who's you know who's skilled to layer and make make more anatomy and make you know because that's what they they like doing that and they love you know they're like so detail oriented about doing doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, good question, but you know if it's a you know it's still it could be a, you know something that is not too aesthetic, we we'll still do it in house. But something that is like really, really big, with like multiple teeth, and you know that it requires a lot more work. It will be it will be done by a ceramist. Interesting. Yeah. Um, if someone grinds or clenches their teeth at night, what would you recommend that the person does or wears? Yeah, yeah, good question. So, and actually, with COVID COVID nineteen, I don't know if you guys read or saw it in the news, but a lot of our patients, a lot of people in, you know, a lot of people in the United States have, and I'm sure in a lot of people in the world, they've been clenching and grinding their teeth because of, you know, a, a little more um, stress and anxiety of not getting sick or, you know, or, you know, whatever it is. We've been seeing a pandemic of broken teeth. Actually, a lot, a lot more patients, they've been breaking their, um, their crowns or they've been breaking their uh, clenching, grinding a lot more. So. One, uh, the go-to, it's uh, a night guard. Um, always recommend a night guard, but there are patients that they clench and grind so much that their masculatory muscles are like super sore and they get pain all, all the way through their neck, back, shoulder, and even headaches. Um, another supplemental option that we always tell them, uh, Botox. Um, but always first a night guard, and then the second treatment option, especially if they having like severe, severe symptoms with like headaches and pain neck and and you know shoulder neck, Botox is another really really good option. Um, we do a bilateral injection of Botox here. I, it's usually you know for severe cases for for male patients because uh, for male patients you know the square jaw will kind of diminish a little bit. But for female patients, it works nice. Is a bilateral injection here, um, of Botox every three, three to four months, and you know the combination of that and a night guard it really helps. What kind of emergency cases do you see? Are they usually with children? Let's say it again. What kind of emergency cases do you get? Um, uh, it. It's usually I don't I don't really see a lot of a lot of children. Um, the other associate at the office uh, where I work at, she sees more of the uh, the kids. I see more of the um, uh, young younger patients slash um, you know um, senior patients. But like I said, uh, the emergencies could be anything from you know like. You know, patient who's been clenching and you know they're just you know they will show up to the office and like you know i'm putting a lot of like sensitivity on my teeth and like like sore jaw and or you know patients like breaking a crown or breaking a tooth so it, it, it can it can be from like you know a broken filling a broken crown to to a root canal or a tooth that is not restorable that we cannot save it anymore and it needs to come out a big infection and you know do like you know on the spot in, uh, an extraction and bone graft and, and you know prescribe antibiotics and pain medication and you know that's another thing that's why that's another I, I forgot to mention that I like emergencies because you know the patient is coming to you for you know they're either you know like they're uncomfortable and you you need to you want to help them and you know it just isn't it doesn't feel much better than helping someone who's like in bad pain and you like help them ease their pain either by doing, you know, pulling a tooth or, you know, doing a, a, a root canal, it, that is the best film. How do you suggest that we work on our manual dexterity skills? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I remember when I was in prenatal, uh, prenatal, in the prenatal club, I remember a lot of students, they, they, they started like baking. Is you know you definitely want to 
you know, like, you know, work those fingers and, you know, someone was like, I think someone even like found a job at, uh, at a picture place because they were, you know, you know, doing the dough and like, you know, it, it sounds silly, but you definitely want to, you know, get used to like, you know, working with, with your hands, with, you know, your fingers and, and things like that. Uh, painting is also a great, great skill. Um, something that, you know, I used to do with my, with my granddad, he was, uh, he was a painter and growing up, um, I always painted with him. And I think that uh, that helped my, my skill of having a steady hand. Um, you know, it, it might, you know, it might be a little too late for, for some of you to start painting, but you know, just for fun, you know, like something that is gonna like require you to like have that tiny little detail. If you can like practice something like very, very small, um, but yeah, some anything that requires you to like do, you know, with hands, like, you know, like baking is probably like the easiest, right? Or sewing or knitting. Right, exactly. Yeah, like little, yeah, seriously. Seriously. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. How was your experience of getting into the dental field after graduating dental school? Um, it was... It was actually interesting, um, you know, not having that faculty that you will rely on sometimes. It just, it's kind of like, well, now, now it's my call. Um, but like I said, I felt, um, I felt super confident uh, graduating from UAC because um, I had like lots of great exposure, um, had lots of like great cases. And um, I think I, it definitely like like anything in life. It takes definitely uh, some time to adapt and some time to adjust. Kind of like the outside world. That's what everyone says outside outside of down school. Because down, down school definitely follows all you know everything. It's a big protocol. And then once you're in, in the outside world, is everything is like fast. Um, but yeah, it, it it took some adjustment for a couple months, and you know. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like riding a uh, bicycle, you know, it gets a little achy at the beginning, but, you know, once you, once you learn to do it, it's just, you know, it's nice and easy. All right. Thank you, Dr. Caicedo. That's all the questions we have for today. You're welcome. You're welcome. No, thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you so much, Dr. Caicedo. Um, we really appreciate you coming out and giving a really informative presentation. And uh, I also want to thank uh, everyone for tuning in to the today's session. Um, we have a session tomorrow. Um, so if you guys can tune into that, that would be very much appreciated. And uh, Kathleen here is going to be posting the quiz in our YouTube chat, and it can also be found you know, on our Instagram. And on that note, I hope everyone has a great rest of their night. Thank you once again.